I came to bury sleep. Curse it, spite that ever I was born to set it. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is the excellent foppery of the world. The language just reveals more and more stuff the more intimate you get with it. But you have to really work hard to get intimate with it. And, and whatever your process for becoming intimate with the language is, you have to start that as soon as you possibly can. Because once you're in an intimate relationship with the language, what's so unique about this particular text is that it will just continue to reveal and reveal and reveal, like layers of an onion, it goes on endlessly. I've had a dream. Past the wit of man to say what dream it was, and then I kind of reached up and felt he thought I had and went from my nose. A man's eyes, this is a very typical thing in Shakespeare, a man's eyes cannot taste, a man's ears cannot see, something like that. He screws, he funds it up all the way. It can be really, really excruciating. <laughs> I've sat through some really, really long and bad productions. I feel like it's our responsibility as, as artists, directors, and actors, and designers, and musicians, and dramaturgs to, to not let that happen. I think part of the problem is that it's a different kind of, it's just, there's a different kind of thought that is involved in a, um, in a Shakespeare speech than is in contemporary speech. We're all about distilling so that there are fewer words, and, um, and that wasn't his way at all. So I think the problem is, is that we, we put a lot of emphasis on each word, and a lot of people, as they think, they think about acting, they, they put so much emphasis on each word. Uh, whereas Shakespeare used mm, thousands of words, uh, his phrases are so much longer. So, it's really about following the thought, and if you can't, as an actor, deliver the thoughts rather than the words, whereas I think most people get stuck on the words. Like, what's that word mean, and how do I dramatically convey the meaning of that word uh, to the audience? Well, they're exhausted by the time you've made it through a sentence, and they don't want the meaning of the word as much as they want the headline of the thought that propels them to the next thought, that propels them to the next thought, that propels them to action. And so it's almost like, you know, um, we've gotten too involved in this game of paraphrasing Shakespeare. What would I be saying if I were saying that in contemporary English? Well, you're not. <laughs> and what you're, really, what you're really trying to deliver is not a translation of the text, but, um, um, for me, I think it's more like a map of the thoughts. And then it becomes much easier to speak Shakespeare for me, and then it becomes much more naturalistic. Because if I look at a speech, say from the Scottish play, what you see a lot of is, if it were done, when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success. And you see the actor there is working all of the ideas in every word. Surcease is a difficult word. Trammel is a difficult word. And you see the actors in those situations rush to go, trammel up, I'm going to show you a net. I'm catching fish. And surcease, going down, I'm dying. And the problem is that as an audience member, we have to follow all of those cues and it becomes really labored. Whereas if you follow the structure of the verse line, which in a 10 beat verse line that kind of ascends at the end, you get a deeper sense of the thought, but it's hard, you get a better sense of the thought, but it's hard to teach that to people because then they have to trust this instinctive thing of, oh, just go up at the end of the line and move quicker, which isn't entirely true. A better way to tell them is to say, where does the thought end and what is the thought? So that then you could put the line, hopefully, if you can figure out a line, like if it were done when it is done, then twere well it were done quickly. Is that the end of the thought? No, because it goes, 
If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his to see success that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. And then what's the next thing? But here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. That's the cherry on the Sunday. That's the end of the thought. So in contemporary English, that would be, God, if we could just get through this. <laughs> If it were just done already, you know, if I didn't have to do it, if it were just already done, wouldn't it be great? Ironically, what we try to do is we try to over-specify the line, whereas it's just a beautiful way of saying that thing, but longer. And because it's longer, it allows for more emotion, because there's more time. But that means you have to move through the thought quicker, so that it becomes, if it were done when tis done, then for well it were done quickly. If the assassination could tremble up the consequence and catch with his or see success that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. And it leaves you in this shuddering place of potential as opposed to if you've labored every line, if it were done when it is done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his or cease, it becomes sort of to me, a legal brief, which is a compelling argument for playing Shakespeare and a smart way to approach it. But it takes too long and the audience becomes agonized. There's two or three feminine endings in it, which means that you've got extra beats at the end of lines, which is a very technical way of saying that it's extending your breath. And if you were to try to do that speech in a way where you didn't take breaths unless you were given a full stop, like a period. You finish a line, you have a period. You take a breath and you say the next line. He writes the end of that speech, and I think intentionally, so that by the end of it, you're left breathless. Actually, the air has been vacuumed out of your lungs, which is what causes people physically to cry, because the diaphragm contracts, and the tear ducts are stimulated, and boom. If you were to try to do it continuously, for me, it starts with, he's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off and pity. That's where it's starting to happen to me. And pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I couldn't do that without an extra couple of breaths, but when you try to, you end up in this place that's like, oh, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. Now he puts a period, which I think is wrong, because I much prefer Vaulting ambition, which or leaps itself and falls on the other, how now, what news? But he doesn't get sighed out. I think people go, that's too fast, I don't understand it, but I think you do understand it. And all those words that come from a, a playwright with a 26,000 voca word vocabulary compared to a 6,000 word vocabulary of the average person now, suddenly become illuminated by the emotion and the thought. You know, uh, if anyone struggles with trammel up after that. They may not know that it was a net that gathers fish, or specifically what the lexicon definition is, but by the thrust of uh, could trammel up the consequence, we get it by the immediacy and the urgency of the emotion and the pace with which it's delivered, it tells you something about what the text is.